okay. So for higher level, it kind of we kind of take every single concept in SL and kind of expand on it and make it a little bit more challenging and kind of incorporate more math and things into it because a lot of HL chemistry is a lot of math oriented things. And so it's not complicated math, but it's application of math. And so um, what we're gonna first do is voltaic cells with this um, cell potential. And so terms we need to kind of focus on here, okay? And this idea, here is uh, electromotive force. Or the EMF. Okay. Um, which causes the electrons to move from anode to cathode. Okay. It's measured as the cell potential, which is E naught. So the concept of electromotive force is what causes the electrons to move across the wire from the anode to the cathode. And we measure that in um, cell potential, essentially volts. And the way we get those values is we compare it. Wait, can you scroll up? Oh, yeah, sure. Page? Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We get those cell potentials by comparing it to a standard hydrogen electrode. And let me write the definition here because this is a definition you may need to know. Um, the standard electrode potential which is what's given to you in your data booklet in table 24 is defined as the potential of the reduction half equation under standard conditions measured relative to the SHE or the standard hydrogen electrode. So all these values that are given to you in your data booklet are the values that you get when you plug it, plug that half cell into and connect it to a standard hydrogen electrode. The E cell of the SHE is equal to zero. So that's why we can do that because whatever the value reads out on the voltmeter, that is assigned to the other half cell because we've assigned the standard hydrogen electrode as zero, kind of our reference point here. The characteristics of the standard hydrogen electrode that you need to know, okay? Inert platinum electrode, okay? One molar 
acid solution, H plus solution, I should say. And then H2 gas at 100 kPa and 298 Kelvin. Okay. So this is what's happening on that half cell and whatever other half cell you're using, you're doing it as one molar as well. So everything's consistent here. And so all these values you see on that chart are relative to that. So you might see something like Mg2 plus plus 2 electrons yields Mg is negative 2.37. And you might see something like Ni2 plus plus 2 electrons yields Ni, which is um, negative 0.26. I'm going to pick a couple of these out here just to kind of show what we're talking about here. And then let's pick a couple of... Okay. So these are a couple of samples from the table that I'm going to use here because I want to talk about this in a couple of different terms. Okay. Because the IB can ask you... Um, to not only calculate the cell potential of a cell, but they might just ask you, like, what's the better oxidizer? What's the better reducer? What's the oxidizing agent? What's the reducing agent? And so with this scenario, you have to really pay close attention to the values here. And what I've done here is I've written all the values in terms of reduction potentials. Okay. Now, the IB might not always do that, so pay attention closely to the reactions they give you. They might reverse a couple of reactions, which you would have to reverse again to make them comparable because the only way you can compare things is if you compare them in the same context. So these reactions, because they're all for reduction, I can compare. If they're all for oxidation, I can also compare. But if two are reduction and two are oxidation, I have to find a way to make them the same, all the same type of reactions so I can compare. And so when I look at this setup here, they're all reductions. So what this setup tells me is that Ag plus is the best reducer. Because in terms of all being reduction reactions, this is the most positive, okay? Now, if you're doing all oxidation reactions, the most positive is the best oxidizer. So don't mix that up. Don't always assume that the most positive is the best reducer. It, the most positive is the best of the type of reaction that you're dealing with. So in this case, because they're all reductions, the most positive is the best reducer. So you would also say it's the best oxidizing agent. Okay. Now along that same vein, because this is the most negative one, it's the worst at the context of your reactions. So it ends up being the best oxidizer, but you have to be really careful because the species that's actually oxidizing is Mg. Because you'd have to flip this reaction around. And so Mg is the best oxidizer, not Mg2+, because Mg2+, can't oxidize anymore. So you have to write it in terms of that. So Mg is the best oxidizer, and therefore the best reducing agent. So keep that in mind that everything's about context and what's actually reducing and what's actually oxidizing here. questions about that.
Yeah, when you said AG class is the best reducer, why didn't you just... Okay, yeah. So, because all these reactions are reduction reactions, Luthia, what that means is that all the reducers are listed on the left side, because those are all actually actively reducing. So your choices for best reducer are Mg2+, Ni2+, Pb2+, and Ag+, because they're reducing toward Mg, Ni, Pb, and Ag. So the actual silver species that reduces, that gains electrons, is Ag+. But when you're talking about oxidizer, you're talking about the reverse reactions. So the best oxidizers are either Mg, Ni, Pb, and Ag, because you want to think of Mg as being... Oops, sorry, let me change the color. This. Right, because that's what Mg does when it's oxidizing. So that's why Mg is your best oxidizer and Ag plus is your best reducer. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, no problem. So now I can use these values to calculate my cell potential of my system here. And so let me just pretend I'm going to use the MG and the AG um, systems here for my calculations, okay? So I know AG plus, plus electron yields AG, which is 0 0.80. And I'm going to use MG2 plus, plus 2 electrons yields MG, which is negative 2.37. So I'm going to use those two values and calculate the cell potential of a system that uses both those half cells together. But again, because we know Mg is oxidizing, we want to flip this reaction around. Okay. And so this cell potential here is 0 0.80 plus 2.37, which gets you 3.17 volts. Now, I will say this. Some books will say reduction minus oxidation because they don't want to flip the reaction around. They just want you to know that you are subtracting the oxidation potential. I don't necessarily like that because I'm going to have to flip the reaction around anyways. So I flip and then add. So if you look at study guides and stuff like that, they might say, um, they might say reduction minus oxidation, which is 0 0.80 minus negative 2.37, which gets you the same thing. Just don't do both things. Like either flip it and get this or do this and get that, but don't do both. But they are the same thing. So if you look at study guides and you are studying from that, they might have you right that way. I just like understanding that you flip the reaction around and you add them together. And the overall reaction is you'd have to double this reaction to get the electrons to cancel. So your overall reaction is 2Ag plus plus Mg yields Mg2 plus plus 2Ag. And therefore it's balanced now. Now, if you're labeling this, and we'll say this is the anode, and this is the cathode, well, silver is reducing, going from plus one 
to zero. So you would have the silver and the silver plus on the cathode side. And the Mg and the Mg2 plus on the anode side. So labeling the cell may have you do that as well because the IB might have you calculate the cell potential and then label the voltaic cell as well. Questions so far? Now, that leads us into the next kind of part of this, which is our delta G is equal to negative NFE. Okay. And this is where we tie in spontaneity with our cell potential. Okay. So N is the number of electrons f is faraday's constant and then e is your cell potential now the number of electrons is how many electrons you canceled out to combine the reactions and so if you look here in this reaction you canceled out two electrons. So your N here is two. Your Faraday's constant is 96,500 coulombs per mole. And our cell potential is 3.17 volts. Okay, essentially volts, just FYI, if it helps you, volts is equal to joules per coulomb. That's why the coulombs cancel out. And you end up with a unit of joules for delta G over here. So let's type that into our calculator right now. Negative 2 times 96,500 times 3.17. Delta G is equal to negative 611,810 joules which then makes delta G is equal to negative 611.81 kilojoules. And this answer makes sense because when you have a positive cell potential, you should have a spontaneous reaction. And so, because 2 is always a positive number, Faraday's constant is always a positive number. So the only value that actually affects the sign of delta G is your cell potential. So if you have a positive cell potential, then you'll have a negative delta G, which means you'll have a spontaneous reaction. Oops. Yes. Sure. The two is from when we balanced the silver and the MG reactions to cancel out the electrons, we had to multiply the first reaction by two so that we canceled out the two electrons. Those two electrons that get canceled out becomes the value of N in this reaction. So yeah, when you're combining the half reactions, whatever number of electrons that you got rid of when you combine them together, that becomes your N. So in this case, it's 2 because um, we had to double the AG reaction. Yeah. Other questions?
weeks. Okay. Okay. Electrolytic cells. For our purposes here, we have two kind of major ones. We have the aqueous, and then we have electroplating. Okay. And so each of them kind of have, they're all kind of the same electrolytic cells, but they're kind of different purposes. And so we have to understand what's happening for each of these systems here. Okay. And so we'll first start on the aqueous cells. What you have to remember is that unlike SL, where you have a molten ionic compound, where you don't have a choice in what oxidizes and what reduces because you only have two ions, the aqueous cell introduces water as a reduction. Actually, you know what? Let me. As an oxidizer and reducer or reducer and oxidizer respectively for this. Okay. And so these half reactions compete against the other ions in the solution to reduce and oxidize, okay? And so they both have values as well. If you look in the data packet, they are posted there. Negative 0 0.83. And um, where is it? Positive one. Oh, actually, sorry. Negative one point two three. Because I had to flip it around. Because they give you the reduction of oxygen with two H pluses, and so I had to flip it around. So negative one point two three. Okay. And so what you have to do now is you have to compare and figure it out now. For multiple choice, you're not going to be looking at values and stuff like that. What you're really going to focus on is the idea that H2O breaks down to H2 and O2. And the fact that H goes from plus 1 to 0 and oxygen goes from minus 2 to 0 helps you kind of predict what's going to happen. Okay. And the rules of this are as such. Okay. Group 1 and 2 metals never reduce in presence of water. So if you have some group one or group two salt and you put it in water, you're never going to get that metal as a product because water will always reduce instead of it. So you will always get H2 gas as your product at the cathode okay the second thing is that um, halogens can oxidize when the concentration is high. Okay. Well, but I'm looking at this here. Let me kind of clarify this. This 
you know what? I'm going to change this because I'm looking at the values here. Chlorine can oxidize with concentration as high. Bromine always oxidizes. I'm kind of surprised that the IB put that on the, the multiple choice that we were looking at earlier because, like, without knowing those, like, cell potentials off the top of your head, it would be really hard to kind of deduce that. Unless the answer choices were so obvious that you didn't have much of a choice to choose it, that's kind of tricky. But chlorine can oxidize when concentration is high. Bromine always oxidizes. So um, that is the competing reaction with the anode here. If it's a low concentration of chlorine, then you're going to get oxygen gas. If it's a high concentration of chlorine, then you'll get chlorine gas. If it's bromine, you'll always get bromine gas. And I guess we'll say also iodine. Okay. So bromine and iodine will always oxidize. Chlorine only at high, and then fluorine never. That's really kind of a weird thing to memorize, but. And that's where you kind of see that idea of NaCl aqueous here. Because when you look at that, and you look at the possible reduction, the possible cathode reactions, you have Na plus, plus electron, you have Na, which according to our table is negative 2.71. Because remember, you can't oxidize Na because there's no Na0 in your solution, only Na plus. So Na can't oxidize because there's no neutral Na in there. It's only Na plus. And then water has a negative 0 0.83 voltage. And so in this case, the, the difference is so significant that there's never a time where sodium will reduce. With the anode, this is negative 1.36. Because remember, when I look up the values on the data booklet, they're all reductions. So I need to flip it and flip the sign when I'm doing that as well. I never multiply the value by anything. I only change the sign when I flip it around. And then water is negative 1.23. And so because they're so close, chlorine will actually be able to oxidize when they're in high concentration because of the fact that chlorine has a negative charge. And so when there's an abundance of chloride ions in the solution, that will actually be more attracted to the anode than neutral water. So whenever they say concentrated, you will make Cl. And when it's a dilute, you will make water. Because water is the better oxidizer, but it's so close that when there's a lot of Cl minus, that will gravitate toward the anode much more quickly and it will oxidize. Be right back, one second.
questions about NACL. So, yeah. Um, you said that there was a, because of the negative chart in the story, it's more. Oh, it is more attracted to the anode because the anode is positively charged. Okay, okay. And so, therefore, what you'll see is that um, because the anode's purpose is to try to attract these species to there so it'll oxidize. And so it's got a positive charge. Well, water is slightly polar, so it'll be attracted there when it's in abundance. But when there's too much Cl- minus there, even though Cl- minus is slightly worse at oxidizing, it'll be more attracted to it, so it'll end up oxidizing instead. Okay, thank you. No, you're welcome. Okay. Other questions? Okay. The next two we'll talk about are copper sulfate ones. And we'll kind of do it in a little bit different method this time because we have done this before, but we'll do it with inert electrodes and we'll do it with copper electrodes. So the idea is that there is a slight difference between that because with the inert electrodes, no copper to oxidize. That's the key difference between there because if you only have copper sulfate and inert electrodes like platinum or graphite, then there's no copper that in metal form to oxidize. So now you don't have a competing reaction like you do with copper electrodes. So for your anode, you have just water here. So you will make O2 gas regardless because there's no competing reaction there. Sulfate doesn't react. Polyatomics don't generally oxidize and reduce. Cathode. Here you do have a competing reaction because you can make H2 gas, which is negative 1.23, oh sorry, negative point, negative 0 0.83. Or you might have copper's reduction and Cu2 plus plus two electrons yields copper. Make sure you're looking at the right copper because there's three different coppers in there. There's Cu2 plus to Cu plus, Cu2 plus to Cu, Cu plus to Cu. So it is Cu2 plus to Cu, which is 0 0.34. So because it's more positive, and they're both reduction reactions, the more positive is better at doing whichever direction the reactions are written. So because this is more positive and... Um, they're both reduction. The more positive is always the better reducer. If they're both oxidizers and the more positive is the better oxidizer. So just keep that in mind. So here you're going to be removing Cu2 plus from the solution. So when you look at observations, you're going to see a couple things. The color of solution disappears or fades, I should say, because the copper is what is creating that colored solution. And as a copper plates, it's no longer in solution. So the, co the color solution will disappear or fade. It'll get lighter. You'll also see O2 gas at the anode. And the anode will get slightly acidic as well. And you'll see copper plate on the cathode.
And so now let's talk about the copper electrodes because the copper electrodes introduce the idea that copper can oxidize as well. Because copper is present in the electrodes, so it can oxidize. So I look up the value of copper oxidation on the data booklet which is the reverse of the copper reduction. So it becomes negative 0.34. And negative 0.34 is more positive than negative 1.23. So therefore it's better at doing whichever type of reaction we're talking about. So in this case, because they're both oxidations, or yeah, they're both oxidizing, the more positive is the better oxidizer. And here we talk about cathode we have the same reactions here. So copper is going to be reducing as well. So now when we talk about observations, the color of the solution is unchanged because whatever copper is reducing, plating, is being replaced by the copper from the anode. So the color of the solution is unchanged. Okay. The copper anode will... erode because it is oxidizing into copper 2 plus no gas no pH change but you'll still have copper plated on the cathode I didn't realize I didn't write the D there so there are distinct differences between this And I feel like I wouldn't memorize the observations too much. I would focus on the anode and cathode reactions, and I feel like you could figure out the observations based on that, seeing as there's no net reaction in the copper electrodes versus being an actual reaction in the inert electrodes. And so I wouldn't spend too much time memorizing all the observations. I would kind of be focused on, okay, how did I choose what is my cathode and what's my anode? Um, and then looking at those reactions, I can kind of deduce what I would see different. Questions about that? Okay, last thing for us to kind of cover today. Oh, let me leave that up here a little bit. Electroplating. Essentially, electroplating is just an electrolytic cell designed with one explicit purpose, and that is to plate an object or um, something on the cathode. And so this is a kind of specific thing where you're, I, you're kind of purifying the metal to remove it from a mixture or you're kind of plating like silver onto a spoon or a jewelry and stuff like that, gold on a jewelry and stuff like that. 
And so with electroplating, the thing you want to focus on here is this. What you want to electroplate, the cathode electrode is the object you are plating, always. So the object that you're plating is always on the cathode because that's where the metal will plate because that's reduction. And so your cathode will always be the object you're plating. Generally speaking, your anode electrode will be the metal you are plating. And the electrolyte will contain metal ion needed to plate. So you want the metal you're going to plate on the anode, you want the object you're going to plate on the cathode, and you want the electrolyte that it's all sitting in to have the metal ion you need to plate. So if you're gold plating a spoon, then your anode would be gold, your electrolyte solution would have gold ions in it, and then your cathode would be your, your spoon. Okay, Kind of like the video we watched in class with the YouTube where he gold plated measuring cups. That was the idea. He had a gold anode, he had a mixture of gold in his solution, and then you had the cups that he plugged into the cathode, which then would cause the metal to plate on those measuring spoons. Actually, you know what, let me do this, okay? Oops. Calculating amount electroplated, okay? So the math here is we need to figure out, based on the information that we have, how much is being electroplated. Like how much metal would be electroplated here? And so I'm going to pick a random metal. We'll say copper is being electroplated. Okay. So for copper's reaction, we're going from 2 plus to, to Cu. Okay. Now, to figure this out, we need to know how much electricity that we're putting it through. How much electricity are we putting through the system to figure out how much metal we can electroplate? And so what this is, is our charge is equal to current times time. And this is in seconds. And this is amps, which are same as coulombs over seconds. Because when we do that, we can figure out our charge. And our charge is equal to coulombs. Which help us then solve for the next part of this problem because we need to convert coulombs into a number that we can measure as well. And so Faraday's constant says that 96,500 coulombs is one mole of electrons. So whatever number of coulombs we have, we can figure out how many moles of electrons we have in that situation. Because we know that 96,500 coulombs is always one mole of electrons. So you can take the coulombs that you get and divide it by 96,500, and that's your number, your moles of electrons.
Now, once we get moles of electrons, we know the moles of mole ratio between our electrons and our metal. And so here, two moles of electrons is required to make one mole of Cu. And then one mole of Cu weighs 63.55 grams. And so we could figure out how much Cu is present. We'll do a practice problem with this, but I just kind of want to show you the framework of doing these problems. And you could do it backwards or forwards. You can start with grams and you could work backwards as well. I'm trying to think because I think I've seen some people do this as one like big equation and the multiple choice they tend to like to do that and so like if I were to combine this let's see okay so I know my current times time don't write this down yet I'm gonna let me sort this out divided by 96,500 is my charge my number my moles of electrons and then i multiply by the mass of the metal and i divide by the moles of electrons needed Yeah, I don't, think that's some, I don't think that's something that you're going to want to memorize. But like on the multiple choice, sometimes they'll say, like, what's the following work that um, shows the mass of copper being produced in this electrolytic cell? And so I don't I wouldn't worry about that. But I just thought, like, is there a way to kind of easily remember that? But I don't think this is like the best way to do it. OK, so let's say. A current of 5 amps is run for 4 minutes in a solution of ALNO3-3. Determine the amount of AL plated. Okay. So the first thing I do with this is I have to write this reaction because I want to make sure I focus on how many moles of electrons I need to plate one mole of aluminum. And so that's AL3 plus plus three electrons yields AL. So that's the first thing that I want to write down so that I get the mole to mole ratio between the electrons and the AL. After that, I will do my charge in Coulombs is equal to 5 amps times 4 minutes times 60 for seconds. So 240 seconds here. Okay. So my charge is essentially 1,200 Coulombs. And then I divide that by 96,500 Coulombs per moles of electrons to figure out how many moles of electrons I have. Mouse, where are you? Where did my mouse go? Oh, okay, there we go. So 1,200. Oops. 1200 divided by 96,500 gets me 0 0.01244 moles of electrons. 
Well, 0 0.01244 moles of electrons. Actually, we'll just do this. Divide by the number of moles of electrons we need per metal. <coughs> so we divide this by 3 means that we can only make 0 0.00415 moles of aluminum. And then we can multiply that by aluminum's molar mass, which I think 26.98 grams. To get 0 0.112 grams of aluminum. And you can kind of work backwards as well. Like I could give you the mass of aluminum and you need to know like how much time you would run it for. And so you'd work backwards here and kind of undo everything, convert it to moles and then convert it to moles of electrons by multiplying by three moles of electrons and then multiply by 96,500 to get the number of coulombs, which then allows you to solve for the time because you have the current here. And so a lot of this stuff is reversible in this scenario. But now that you see the calculation here, there are only three factors that affect the amount electroplated. One, current. Two, time. And three, charge of the metal. Okay. So whatever the charge of the metal is determines how many moles of electrons you need. The time and the current obviously affect how much charge you're able to put into the solution. And those are the three factors that are involved in all your calculations to get the final answer. Now the mass would be slightly different. If, you ha if, every if all the metals had the same charge, the mass would be different because even though you had the same number of moles, you'd have different molar masses, so that would affect it as well. So be careful about that because if I'm saying like the mass that's electroplated, if they're all the same charge, the one with the greater molar mass would plate more mass. But when we're talking about amount, we're talking about moles, and the moles would be the same for all of them. questions about that okay that is it for topic 19 so we went over calculating cell potentials we went over um, identifying what's the better oxidizer and what's better reducer using cell potentials we talked about electrolytic cells mainly aqueous ones where you have to decide between what's oxidizing what's reducing um, and we talked about electroplating and how to calculate the the values for that um, given the current and the time and the identity of the metal so that we can accurately calculate the mass and those are the main ideas and we also did delta g to calculate the um, gibbs free energy of a reaction if it was an electrolytic reaction you would get a positive number because you'd get a negative cell potential so um that would make a positive delta G and that means it's non-spontaneous. So that would also reinforce the idea that electrolytic cells are non-spontaneous. Okay. That's the end of topic 19.